Welcome back, Bad Things family. During European colonization of the Americas, a lot of indigenous people were just royally screwed over. It's a fact. This week, we're going to be talking about the Cherokee people. If you'd like to hear about other tribes, other indigenous people, this sort of thing, let us know in the comments, and I'm sure we can accommodate. The Cherokee were unlike any other group in North America during the 18th and 19th centuries. While colonists of European descent tended to despise those who were different, the Cherokee adopted all sorts of people into their tribe. And while other Native American tribes wanted to continue fighting the United States, the Cherokee decided to adopt the European way of life. For the proud and hopeful Native people of the Southern Appalachian region, assimilation would not save them. All of their dreams would be crushed. And before the worst was over, many of them would be fighting to preserve slavery in the Confederacy. This is a cautionary tale that shows sometimes you can do everything right and still be wrong. In the 1700s, the Cherokee occupied portions of North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama. Most of their range was west of the Appalachian Mountains. Initially, the British and the Cherokee were allies. During the French and Indian Wars, which were fought for decades, the Cherokee allied with the British. After several decades, both sides began to suspect the other of betrayal. Eventually, this ended in violence in 1759 when a Virginia militia attacked some Cherokee because of suspected horse thievery. The Cherokee responded by attacking white settlements, and war began. The Cherokee defeated the colonists and even reclaimed some of their land that had been lost to them earlier. The first wave of British troops were also defeated. The second attempt by the British destroyed many Cherokee settlements and finally convinced them to negotiate a peace treaty. In 1761, the Cherokee made peace with the British and the colonists. The British were not resentful of the Cherokee after the war, but seemed to respect them. A Cherokee delegation even traveled to England and was received in King George's court. Colonists did not appreciate the gesture at all. They saw the Cherokee as gaining favor with the English aristocracy in an attempt to keep the colonies from expanding. It would be one of the contributing factors for the Revolutionary War. In 1763, a royal decree was issued which forbade settlers from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains. but. The British found it very difficult to enforce. Settlers continued to move into Cherokee lands and it was not going to be ignored forever. The Revolutionary War began in 1776 and the Cherokee again allied with the British. Dragging Canoe, born in 1738, was the main war chief for the Cherokee by this time. He earned a reputation fighting in the French and Indian Wars. Once he began to fight again in 1776, he wouldn't stop until his death. He attacked colonists all over the Appalachian area, inflicting numerous casualties. The economic damage was significant as well. The British finally gave up fighting in 1782. The Cherokee, being more determined than their European ally, were not inclined to stop after only six years. Dragon Canoe continued fighting with the United States until his death in 1792. Finally, in 1794, the Cherokee and the United States made peace with each other. For a time at least, it appeared that the Cherokee might have also earned respect from the former colonists. Additionally, in the late 1700s, the ethnic composition of the tribes changed significantly. During the 18th century, many of the representatives sent to negotiate with the Cherokee were of Scottish descent, mostly from the Highlands. Many of them remained with the Cherokee and took wives from the tribe. They were in turn adopted by the Cherokee and their children were considered members as well. After making peace with the United States, many Cherokee decided it was better to adapt to the ways of their white neighbors. The influence of Scottish members of the tribe may have played a part. But the influence of George Washington was definitely felt in this endeavor. Washington was all too aware of how much trouble the Cherokee could cause when properly enraged, so he strongly encouraged them to settle down and adopt the ways of white Southern culture. Under his administration, the federal government actually provided much of the technology required for the Cherokee to transition to an agricultural society. 
War came again in 1812 when the British invaded. This time, the Cherokee allied with the United States. Many of them fought under Andrew Jackson and were with him at the Battle of New Orleans. The bravery of his Cherokee troops was essential to defeating the British. In 1828, a full generation after their assimilation began, the Cherokee created their own national government. They also created a constitution modeled after the U.S. Constitution, which established a government with the familiar three branches. John Ross was elected as principal chief and held that role until his death in 1866. John Ross, born in 1790, was among the second generation of mixed-race council members. His mother was Cherokee and his father Scottish. Ross was well-educated and demonstrated that he was a proficient businessman as well. He started a ferry service which carried people through Cherokee territory. He also started a tobacco plantation. His interest in tribal politics also made him a good candidate for a leadership position. Many of the full-blooded Cherokee supported Ross because they believed he was best equipped to negotiate successfully with the United States. Unfortunately, Georgia still wanted Cherokee land. They even intended to sell it off via a lottery system. Some Cherokee decided that fighting with the settlers again was a lost cause. They became known as the Treaty Party and began selling Cherokee land and making their own deals with the U.S. government. They eventually moved to Arkansas voluntarily, although their residence there would be short-lived. For the rest of the Cherokee, John Ross attempted to negotiate on their behalf in the hope they might be able to remain in their ancestral lands. In 1830, Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act into law. It allowed him to move the Cherokee and other indigenous people west of the Mississippi River. The law was challenged, and Ross had a victory of sorts as the Supreme Court ruled that Jackson could not force the Cherokee off their land. Andrew Jackson, who had previously commanded the Cherokee in battle, decided to ignore the Supreme Court and force the Cherokee to move anyway. The reasons aren't entirely clear, but one possibility is because of the nullification crisis. Jackson enacted tariffs that enraged the state of South Carolina. South Carolina refused to accept the tariffs and were even prepared to take up arms against the United States if necessary. Jackson, politically, could not afford to have another southern state on the edge of rebellion. The more official reason given by Jackson was that the Supreme Court didn't have jurisdiction in a case between Georgia and indigenous people, so the ruling did not have to be enforced. Whatever reasons led to it, the result was the Trail of Tears. The United States military forcibly marched Cherokee from their homes to new lands in Oklahoma, west of the Mississippi River. Nearly 25% of those who were forced to march died during the trip. John Ross also lost his wife during the forced migrations. Not all Cherokee left as instructed. Many hid in the wilderness and avoided the military. Some of them approached William Holland Thomas, who was an attorney, to negotiate on their behalf. Thomas represented the tribes in negotiations and also bought land in North Carolina using their funds as well as some of his own. The land was officially owned by Thomas as Cherokee were not allowed to own land outside designated Indian territory. During the 1830s, Thomas was adopted by the Cherokee. The members that stayed on the land in North Carolina became known as the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. William Thomas was elected as their principal chief. He is the only white man to ever hold this position. Further divisions occurred among the Cherokee in the 1830s. The Treaty Party, when selling land to the U.S. government, violated an ancient Cherokee blood law. According to that law, those that sold the land should be put to death. It is not known if John Ross gave his approval but his son was enraged at the violation of Cherokee law. In 1839, with the help of 25 John Ross supporters, he killed everyone in the treaty party. Only one person, Stan Wadey, escaped with his life. Stan Wadey fled to Arkansas and was principal chief of that band. Just to review then, by the 1840s, there were three different tribes of Cherokee. The Cherokee Nation consisted of John Ross and the members of his tribe that were forcibly marched to Oklahoma. 
The eastern band of Cherokee Indians included those who managed to avoid being removed, and the band in Arkansas would eventually be relocated to Oklahoma as well. They would become known as the United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians. Despite being forcibly relocated, many of the Cherokees still practiced Southern culture that had been adopted two generations earlier. Among these cultural habits was slavery. Owning slaves, combined with a growing resentment of the United States government, led to yet another unfortunate choice when war broke out again. When South Carolina fired on Union troops in 1861 and the Civil War began, two of the three tribes made their allegiances known right away. William Thomas pledged himself and the Eastern Band of Cherokee to the Confederacy. Stand Weighty also sided with the Southern states. John Ross was firmly on the side of the Union. Thomas's Legion of Cherokee Indians and Highlanders fought under the Confederate Army in Tennessee. They held the distinction of firing the last shot of the Civil War east of the Mississippi River. On May 6, 1865, they captured Waynesville, North Carolina. On the previous night, the Legion started numerous fires and spent the night making loud war calls. They used deception to make Union troops think thousands of Cherokee and Confederates were going to attack the town. In the morning, Thomas and 20 Cherokee entered Waynesville under a flag of truce and demanded the Union garrison surrender. They surrendered immediately. On May 9th, Thomas learned that Robert E. Lee had surrendered, so he ordered his men to stand down and surrendered as well. While the Eastern Band was united during the war, the Cherokee Nation was not. Initially, Ross refused to deal with the Confederacy, but after the Union abandoned their posts in Cherokee Nation land, he felt he had no choice. In 1861, John Ross made an agreement with the Confederacy. By the following year, he regretted having done so. He took many of the tribal records and a portion of the Cherokee tribe and moved to Union-held Kansas. Stan Wadey took over as the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation that remained. At this point, he was a general in the Confederate Army, the only Native American to ever serve as a general. On June 25, 1865, he became the last Confederate general to stop fighting. The armistice the United States government signed allowed Stand Weighty to demobilize his troops and let them go home without surrendering. After the war ended, the United States government required the Cherokee to sign a new treaty due to having joined the Confederacy. Stand Weighty was principal chief at the time and attempted to negotiate, but the government would only accept someone who was loyal to the Union. Weighty stepped down and John Ross was brought back into his role as principal chief. Ross died in 1866 before the treaty could be completed. His successor continued negotiating, but the results were not encouraging for the Cherokee. The U.S. government forced white settlement of Cherokee lands. It dismantled the government structures and institutions the Cherokee had created. The tribes were forced to adopt any slaves that they held. The Cherokee were punished for their participation in the Civil War far more than any southern state. Reconstruction was an unmitigated disaster for their way of life. Before European settlement, the Cherokee population is estimated to have been as high as 50,000. By the time of the Indian Removal Act, that number was closer to 20,000. And the number was down to between 10,000 and 15,000 when the Cherokee finally arrived in Oklahoma. It is impressive that such a small group could successfully fight against European settlers for almost two centuries. And it is quite troubling that settlers saw these people as such a threat that they had to be forcibly removed. While the United States did not succeed at committing genocide, it seems to be more out of incompetence than goodwill. At the same time, Cherokee morality is both inspiring and troubling. They would adopt almost anyone into their tribe, no matter the ethnicity. But the Cherokee also adopted the practice of slavery without any concern for those they enslaved. How do you feel about the Cherokee? When they fought for the Confederacy, was it just good people making a misguided choice? Or did their attempt to convert to a European way of life ultimately corrupt them? Hey, before you go, do us any little thing. Drop us a comment, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel for more. 
We'd love to see you again. And as always, thanks for watching Bad Things in History. <laughs>